Matthew as well. Okay, I will get things up and going. Check the screen. Yep. Okay. And let's see. Okay. All right. Can we all see that? Okay. Pretty good. Okay. All right, good. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna to be talking about a bit of a passion project of mine that has come to fruition now that I've finished grad school and with the help of the Soma Paleontology Database, which is Where the Wild Things Were, a online atlas of charismatic animal losses from the Pleistocene to today. Um, I've been working on it for uh, about two years now with a lot of help from my good friend Shane Loeffler, who made Flyover Country, a resource for outreach that also uses a lot of Neotoma, and Lisa White, who's the Director of Education and Outreach at the UC Museum of Paleontology. So to start, what if I told you that up until about the 1500s, you could find brown bears uh, in Egypt near Cairo or nearby um, in Tel Aviv, you could find 3,000 years ago hippos alongside rhinos and warthogs. These are some incisors, front teeth from some hippos, uh, presumably used as ivory at the time. Or this map shows until about the 1500s again, as far west as Turkey, a little bit cut off on this map, but as far west as Turkey, you could find Asian elephants, or as far northeast as near Beijing around the same time. Or one of my personal favorites, this is a cave locality in northern Spain, where looking at some of the finger bones that have been found, there are these parallel cut marks that are indicative of butchering, but fingers don't really have that much meat on them. So the implication here is that these animals were being processed, not for their meat, but for their pelts, which would mean that someone was wearing a cave lion, Panthera spilea, pelt around in the Paleolithic Spain. So in grad school, I kind of just stumbled upon these things piecemeal and thought, wow, wouldn't it be really cool if instead of just finding these things when I want to do something that feels like, say, writing grant applications, but I'm too tired, so I'm going to do something related to my work. I actually made a curated resource of all these things, and now I finally got around to it. Uh, this is where the wild things were, and so I'm going to jump in to the website itself. Okay, so it's hosted through the UCMP's web uh, site. Here we have a bit of an overview for people um, diving into it, a GIF showing this is our American Lion Panthera Aatrox entry, showing how the interface looks, how things work a little bit. And then we have uh, links to all of the collections. And with this initial version that we're running with, each of these entries are made in ArcGIS story maps, which is convenient for me to make it using just a point and click interface and convenient for the user to be able to browse and pan around perhaps more easily. Towards the bottom of this page, I have links to other pages related to where the wild things were, including a bit of background of who we are, who made it, um, finding the wild things, including using Neotoma to include these data, linking paleontology and conservation biology through conservation paleobiology, and a really strong effort I've been trying to make to make this accessible um, for a broader audience. So I'm going to jump into the saber tooth cats entry on Smilodon vitalis. I think highlights Neotoma data pretty well. Uh, had a lot of fun coming up with the titles for these two. But uh, with each of these, I like to start out with a bit of natural history. Also, this is a Creative Commons video that someone made of Smilodon hunting a Pleistocene horse. Um, I do note here that Smilodon was likely more of an ambush predator than a chaser. But anyway, I have these natural history data to get the user caught up to speed with, okay, how do these extinct animals relate to extant animals or some background information they might already have? So a little bit of fun stuff here with Smilodon, including why the saber tooth um, morphology, a bit more functional. Uh, morphology here too, and then get into the geography of things, showing here's a range map of Smilodon. It's taking a little bit of time to render, but anyway, and then the next 
map here shows uh, localities of Smilodon pulled directly from the Atoma and a prompt for the user to say, oh, you can explore these dots to learn more. And I highlight a couple areas of interest, one of them being the famous Rancho Libre Tar Pits in what's now downtown Los Angeles to talk about, okay, there are a lot of Smilodon fossils that have been found there, but that is ecologically weird that you'd have so many carnivores, especially relative to the number of herbivores that have been found get into a bit of taphonomy about why that might be. Then pan over to Florida to say, likewise, there are a lot of smilodon fossils that are, say, in the Atoma here. Talk a bit about taphonomy, showing large carbonate areas that uh, get into why caves are good depositional systems. Then pan over to a bit further north into, say, West Virginia, a bit of um, localities out east to, to really try to build the sense with each of these entries of a sense of place and connection for hopefully a user to say, wow, for example, I grew up in Nashville, but I didn't know that there were saber tooth cats nearby as one instance, okay? And then I hope that leads into a natural question of, okay, these animals were widespread, what happened? What about extinction? How did that occur? And I get into what I hope is a very up-to-date critical perspective on extinction theory with Lake Quaternary extinctions going through uh, each of these species and at a broader level to get at how this is still a very active field of research. Um, get into ideas about climate change related to extinctions. And then in each of these, I hope that, again, naturally leads to a conservation connection between extinction range contractions through time and what that means for extant animals that are left. Um, with Smilodon, there isn't really a living analog that's good for comparison. So this one, I turned it into more of a story about large carnivores and trophic ecology. So I give what's now a classic example of wolves in Yellowstone being extirpated and reintroduced and the ecological consequences of that. And then talk a bit about large carnivores and ice age food webs, talk about a bit of isotopic ecology in terms of chemicals in the bones to make sure that I'm not using jargon in any of this as well, and talk about the ecological, oh, sorry about that. I'm just gonna stop that just a second. Okay. All right, so my apologies. Okay, anyway, okay. And then talk about, yeah, um, human wildlife conflict, especially for large carnivores and how people are actively going about mitigating that to promote a world where both large carnivores and humans can thrive. So at the end of each of these entries, I include some links for more information if the user is curious or if they are so inclined and able, some nonprofits say working on a species by species basis or conservation um, to follow through social media or if they have the resources to donate to. Okay. So then getting back to my presentation here. Okay. Some things moving forward. Um, a lot of where the wild things were is fundamentally built on Natoma. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm curious about the history of grizzly bears in North America. Um, it's really well known that they used to be found throughout the Western United States, but there are a lot of Eastern localities are present here in the Atoma that I'd be very curious to explore more. From what I've read, the Holocene history of Eastern range contraction of grizzly bears is um, pretty unresolved. So I'd like to explore that a bit and share that a bit through where the wild things were. And likewise with wolves, I think a fair amount of people know that they're pretty widespread throughout North America um, in the historic and Holocene further past, but I'd like to use that with the localities of the Atoma as an opportunity to dive into some of these localities and really share more about the historical ecology and a bit of the cultural history surrounding these animals and where they once were. I'm also curious outside of North America to include some stories. For example, last year around this time, uh, cheetahs were reintroduced to India. They had been extirpated for the past 70 years. And I'd like to use that as an opportunity for uh, the question of, wait, what do you mean that cheetahs used to be in India and explore the historic range of cheetahs. And likewise, this is one of my favorite maps that I've found so far related to where the wild things were. 
completely independent of current events, but learned that up until about the 1300s, you could find tigers as far west as near Kharkiv. So I'd love to make an entry on tigers and how their range has contracted through time as well. One thing I'm working on is uh, have a grant application. I'm waiting to hear back on, fingers crossed, uh, incorporating where the wild things were with an ongoing program through the UC Museum of Pale Paleontology called Access Paleo, which makes lesson plans for community colleges. Um, a handful of them are virtual, so I'd love to engage with community college courses using where the wild things were. I propose two entries related to more regional approaches, uh, one in the San Francisco Bay Area and two in the LA Basin, Los Angeles Basin, to get at their very rich quaternary paleontology and historical ecology uh, stories that uh, underlie those areas and would be really fun to share. I'm also teaching myself a bit more programming to go from a point and click interface to a more refined cartographic interface uh, following this GitHub workbook on uh, web cartography. Um, it's been really good so far and, and leaning, learning a bit more about Leaflet and D3 to make it a bit more immersive as a whole. So with that, thank you so much for tuning in here, uh, listening to this, and uh, I am happy to entertain any of your questions during the discussion section. Thank you again.